us all when we have folks come in that want to judge and say, well, I'll judge a barbecue. I judge all the time. I know what a good barbecue is. But you see, in our process of judging barbecue, it is not knowing just what good barbecue is to your taste. It's how we judge barbecue to get the best effect from you and give that cook the best judging he can possibly or she can possibly get. And that's what this is all about. And you're going to probably hear some things and see some things today that you probably don't realize or perhaps have never thought about in judging barbecue. And it's our procedure. Yeah. There are other organizations that judge differently. If any of you happen to be members of main judges, they use a half line and a half on site. We use all completely blind. Excuse Back to the barbecue. What the U.S. government defines barbecue as, and it is, barbecue meat such as a product labeled beef barbecue or barbecue pork shall be cooked by the direct action of dry heat. Now this is the U.S. government rating of barbecue, all right? Cooked by the action of dry heat resulting from the burning of hard wood or hot coals, therefore from a sufficient, for a sufficient period of time to assume the unusual characteristics of a barbecued article, which include the formation of a brown crust on the surface and the rendering of surface fat. Uh, let's see here. Okay, the product may be basted with a sauce during the cooking process. The weight of the barbecue meat shall not exceed 70 percent. The cooked meat shall not exceed 70 percent of the weight of the fresh uncooked meat. So you lose losing 30 percent. That is uh, by government standards. That's there. Let's go through rules with you. We're going to go through the process of what judging is all about, what KCBS is all about in a barbecue contest and as far as judging as such. Uh, categories to be judged will be four basic categories in our classification. And that is pork ribs. They can either be loin back ribs, referred to as baby back ribs, or they can be spare ribs. <coughs> but they must be pork ribs. That's the four basic categories. Uh, one of the four basic categories. The other is chicken. We specify chicken only, not poultry, because there are other categories in poultry, but chicken only. Now the chicken can be turned in either as uh, a half chicken, a whole chicken cut up, a white meat, a dark meat, whatever the cook so decides. Uh, the, uh, the other item that is turned in is pork butt or pork shoulder. Now the pork butt, of course, is the top half of the shoulder and uh, it's called the blade roast or the Boston butt. We require the cook to cook it in its, enti in its entirety. It cannot be severed out by muscle. They can bone it out if they so desire, but it must be cooked in its entirety. We do not allow at this time loin or tenderloins whatsoever, okay? The area that, or the item that we cook is beef brisket, which happens to be one of the toughest pieces of meat there is to cook. We cook right, but can be the most tender, most flavorful piece of meat if properly cooked. Uh, <clears throat> Beef brisket, of course, comes from the fore, uh, front uh, chest area of the animal, and uh, it's a very, very tight muscle. It has two parts to it, which is the point end and the flat. A lot of times in the store, you'll find just the flat cut up, which is the solid piece of meat. The point end has more fat rendering through it. It is the most tender or tasty piece of the meat. The point is when it is cooked right away. Uh, and it's used a lot out of our area where you refer to burnt ends. It's what's used for burnt ends because it's the most tasty. However, you'll find that most of the cooks will turn in the flat of the brisket, which is the tighter part of the meat. And it makes the best presentation, but uh, it necessarily also at times has the most taste to it, but it has to be worked with so it doesn't dry out. One of the most makes the best presentation, but uh, it necessarily also, at times, has the most taste to it, but it has to be worked with so it doesn't dry out. One of the most difficult, the most difficult factors of brisket when it comes to contest is if it, it, brisket has a tendency to dry quite rapidly. Uh, and if it's cut too thin, it will dry out faster than it will if it's thick. And of course, if it's cut too thick and it isn't tender, it's going to be very difficult to judge, and the judge is going to give it a low score. So the cook has to be very careful when it comes time to turn brisket in. You'll see a lot of them, uh, if you had the chance, or perhaps if you had been to a contest and watched, you'll see where they will bring the tray in, they've got it wrapped with a towel or some kind of cloth to keep the heat in there, to keep the moisture in there, because there's nothing worse than tasting a piece of dry brisket. 
and cook brisket a lot in contests. There are ways to keep it moist, uh, but that's something that is the most difficult part for the judge to determine if that piece of meat is dried out. If there are any problems at the judging table, for example, if you see something come in that you're not sure about, you call the table captain over and ask the table captain for an opinion, and the table captain will then make the decision. If he or she cannot make the decision on a particular entry, they will get a hold of the head judge who was working that area. And usually the head judge is a KCBS representative that is in the area, and they will make the decision as such. Now, if the table captain sees an entry come in, and it isn't right, or perhaps there was something in there that shouldn't be in there, they can make the decision at that time and tell you how to judge it. Table captains are your head judge at your particular table. They run that table. And if they see that you're not judging properly, they see that you're talking, they see that you're motioning or giving some sort of an expression to another judge, at that table while you are judging a particular entry, they will call you down on it. Because after all, as I said earlier, we want your opinion and your opinion only. Just stop and think for a minute. When you look out here at all these contestants, or no matter what contest you go to, but let's take this contest for example. It cost them $400 just for an entry fee, the cook. Just for the entry fee. Not the transportation out here not the meat that they bought. I do a lot of cooking myself, and I do contest cooking, and I thought about coming out here to enter the contest, but when I figured what it cost me, and this is no kidding, I figured, including the entry fee, driving out and getting back, and it didn't win anything, I was gonna spend two grand, and I didn't think I could handle that right now. Judging, or a pitfall of judging, number one is eating too much when it comes out there. Now, we require that the cook puts in, and this is something to keep track of because this is part of the judging procedure, we require that the cook puts in to the container six, a minimum of six identifiable pieces of meat. Now that doesn't mean that four of them can be underneath something and two showing on top or vice versa. You have to look at that container and it has to be six. So the, one of the pitfalls is not paying very very much attention to that tray when it comes in. You look at it, I'll say, gee, that looks good. I'm going to give that some. So we're going to discuss how you score the point. Besides eating too much, if there's more than six in there, is thinking that your way of tasting meat and looking at it is the only proper way to judge. <coughs> Excuse me. I've heard many folks say, oh, I don't need to judge. Go to your judging class. I've judged. Well, I know what barbecue is. Well, those are usually the ones that give trouble to the cooks because they didn't realize what, what was in that tray and how to judge it. <coughs> knowing barbecue is usually knowing your taste, but not knowing how to judge everybody's food that's out there. And that's what's important because here again, we're here for the entire cooking crew. I have to cut this down with the time, so I'm skipping around a little bit. How do we judge? as far as scoring is concerned. Our scoring system, now remember this goes from nine to one. Nine being the very best, and one being usually disqualification. There are no zeros in our judging system, none whatsoever. There are ones, and there are nines. When you look at a container, the first thing you're going to do is judge it for appearance. That's going to be the first item. Now the table captain is going to bring a certain number of trays to the table. And in this particular day, we may only have a couple, but if you're judging a real contest, you'd have six trays on that table. The table captain will open one tray at a time, get you to look at it for appearance, and you mark your score down. They close the lid, you open, they open the next tray, and so forth, and you judge. Judging, we want your honest opinion the way you see it when it comes to the table. And you cannot change your score by erasing. Even though you have erasers today, you do not erase. 
on your scorecard if you had to change your score only by an accident because of the way that you marked it down in the wrong column, you would draw a line through it, and then again, you can only score up. You cannot score down. But we want you to be accurate when you score, so you put that score in there the way you feel it should be and in the right column. And we're gonna go through score sheets before this is over this morning, before you get the food to start judging. And you're gonna be judging all four categories today. Well, if it comes to the table and they open that container and you look at it, remember this is a meat contest now. You're judging the meat. And that meat looks so appetizing and looks so mouth-watering that you cannot wait to get into it, that to me would be a nine. But if it looks like it was just thrown in the container in no special order, arranged very sloppily, and you're out at a restaurant and you say, gee, I've heard so much about this place, they don't care how they even present it then that way you would judge down accordingly. Because if there's no care taken, presentation doesn't mean too much, does it? So it's in the beholder of the eye as far as presentation is concerned. Now, another part of our presentation is we use and allow only leaves, leaves of green leaf lettuce. Now, Leafy lettuce or green leaf lettuce that is so called in the grocery store is really the best type to use. But if they want to use head lettuce, there's nothing wrong with that because it is in the lettuce family. They can use Boston bib, which is a small head lettuce. But that's all they can use is in the lettuce family. No kale, no cabbage, and so forth. The only other item we allow in the container is, besides green leaf lettuce, they can put and or curly leaf parsley. No flat leaf parsley, only curly leaf. Now, with any of those items, and they cannot use red tip lettuce, so this is all in appearance now, so keep this in mind. So when a container is opened, and it has anything in it other than that, they're disqualified to get a one in appearance. If it has anything in it other than that, they're disqualified to get a one in appearance. A one in appearance. It could be red tip lettuce, it could be toothpicks, which we do not allow. It could be foil, which we do not allow. It could be stuffing of some sort, which we do not allow. That would all give them a one. So in appearance, they would be disqualified. I want you to judge it with sauce on it. They may brush the entire piece of meat on it. But now if there is so much sauce on that meat that you can't taste the meat, you can only taste the sauce, what are you gonna do? You're gonna judge down, in your opinion, to whatever you feel it should be because here again this is a meat contest not a sauce contest we have a uh, whole stalk of green leaf lettuce and you just cut it off at the the base the core you have a little core down there well they'd hollow it out because they didn't have containers and they pour sauce in there and stick it in there and they think they get by with it that's puddling with putting cups of sauce in you don't do is marks and sometimes I confuse people with this, but there has been, it has been known <coughs> for some cooks to mark trays or contain it when they know they have some friends of theirs out there judging and hopes that that tray gets to that particular table. But if you see a bunch of fingerprints in a container or you see a, an X marked somewhere in the container with, with a, a fingernail or you see a little corner maybe tab that broke off, check with your table captain. Or maybe they have a design on the meat with their sauce. If there's a design in there that's real evident, make sure you take, check with your table captain. The table captain may even have to check with one of the reps, KCBS, because it, have been, it has been known to design a certain little way of presenting the meat. Some people will roll up their brisket and put parsley in it and make little flowers. That's a no-no, because that can be interpreted as a mark. You know, it may not be to that particular cook, may have nothing in mind, but to the judges out there, that to me would signify that somebody's trying to say something to someone because the majority of the cooks don't do it that way. Presentation, so if you're in doubt when it comes to presenting that particular item for scoring, talk to your table captain. And it takes a little clarification and a little studying that particular piece of meat to get it through.
The American Royal this year, we had like 324 teams. Two of them were disqualified for doing the wrong thing. One was not disqualified. The table captain brought, I have to be working in that area, the table captain brought the product to me thinking it was pork loin or tenderloin, and it really wasn't. It was very evident that it was pork shoulder. You could tell by some of the muscles in there, so we didn't disqualify it. But these things happen. It doesn't stop, it doesn't stop you from being artistic now. But it's things that stand out that are so different from anybody else. All right, now let's talk about what ribs. The ribs come in on the side. Well, the ribs came in all flat. Well, the ribs came in laying flat like they were cut off the bone, and maybe one or two were on the side. That's fine. Nothing is wrong with either one of those three presentations, or any one of those three presentations. Because some folks like to cut the ribs off as they come off the bone and lay them nice and neatly in the container, and that's as far as it goes. Then you have the team that may do it that way, but in addition to that, turn one rib on its side or maybe two ribs on its side. Now, what are they doing this for? They're doing it for you to see that how they were cooked and how they looked laying out flat, but they want you to see that pinkness in the rib as the way the smoke penetrated it. Now, when you see pink bones, now I'm sure most of you here realize that it's smoked meat, but when you see pink, it is done. It is not raw. And you'd be surprised. Sometimes we get strange judges. Especially someone that says, oh, I know barbecue, and judge it down because they saw a pink rib. I hope it's pink because that shows good, a good smoking process. Now, they may glaze that rib with sauce. They may not. But as long as you can taste the meat, that's all that matters. Now, another thing you might see in presentation is when chicken comes in. Now here's where we run into a little problem sometimes in convincing a cook that there must be six identifiable pieces in the container. I've seen cooks take a half a chicken, lay it in a container, lift up the skin, cut the breast portion only in the six pieces, lay the skin back over it, put it in the container because it looks nice as a half a chicken. Well remember, you as a judge, cannot touch that meat to turn it, to look at it, or even smell it until it gets on your judging plate, which you will have today to put the meat on. Cut the breast into six pieces and put the skin back over it. What would you score it as on appearance? Hmm? Anybody, what would you score it as? One. One, absolutely. Because what did I say? There must be six identifiable pieces in that container half a chicken breast in there, or a whole chicken, or rather a half a chicken, and then they'll put up, take that other half a chicken and cut it into six pieces. Maybe a thigh, a leg, the breast cut up, and a wing, and so forth. That's fine. But if they put two chicken breasts in and didn't cut them, what happens? They get a one. Sometimes they'll turn a, and this is where you find it a lot of times, in the thigh, or in the leg, when you look at it, it's usually not too evident until you go to pick it up, taste it, touch it. You see a lot of redness around the bone. If the juice is running clear, and when you touch it, it is not bloody. That chicken is done. The characteristic of smoked chicken is to get all this redness and darkness around the bone. Now, I've heard a story one time where a man, in fact, a commercial individual that sells chicken and emphasizes fresh chicken. He told me that fresh chicken won't do it, it's only frozen chickens. I found out fresh chicken does it too. Whether, you cook, whether the cook is cooking fresh chicken or frozen chicken, it still has the characteristic of giving you the bloodiness or the blood factor around the bone. And if there's legs in there, you know, what happens too when there's chicken? You know, there's six of you at a table, and there may be a chicken breast cut up into six pieces, there may be two legs in there, and there may be a wing, there may be a couple thighs. Well, the reason the cook is doing that is, number one, there are folks that just like dark meat, and there are folks that like white meat, so he's giving you a choice, and you judge what you taste. When that tray comes to the table, and there are not six pieces of meat in that container, a guy sitting next to you got a dirty old pocket knife cannot cut it up and hand you it. That's out. 
We used to see that happen, believe me. We don't want the judge sitting next to you to handle. I wouldn't want him to handle any other thing I have. We just hope that that cook out there was very careful and very clean, and the cleanliness that he presents around the area was represented in the tray. There's enough in there for you to try both the dark and the light. Judge it as such, make your comparison, make your determination. Okay? Now let's talk about looking at pork for a minute. Remember you're getting the shoulder or the pork butt. And it can be sliced. In the Midwest, and I'm sure more on towards the West, the pork has a tendency to be sliced more than pulled. Down south, they pull it more than slice it. To me, there's nothing better than fresh cooked pulled pork. It just has a different taste than anything else. And I know once around the Kansas City area where we originated with this barbecue society and, and our cooks are, but now it's getting to the point where we will maybe just straight pull it. We may pull it and slice it. We may pull it, slice it, and chomp it. And if you'd like to taste all three, do so. Make an evaluation when that tray comes in. Because I'm sure you're going to see some of that here, if any of you have to be judging tomorrow. When you're judging pork, of course, when it's sliced, you're going to judge it for its flavor, its taste, and it's going to be bark put in the container. Do all of you know what bark is on a piece of pork? Anybody that doesn't know what bark is? Good, because that's the best part of it. It's where all the flavor is in the season. You mix that in with the rest of it, you get a good piece of pork. You don't want to have a big piece of fat or a chunk of fat in your mouth. So these are the things when you're judging pork. Now what about brisket? When you're judging brisket, it's going to come in sliced. 99% of the brisket that comes in you is going to be sliced. In that slice container, there may be some burnt ends. And as I mentioned earlier, the best burnt ends come from the point end of the brisket. Some folks, teams, that cook only the point end for burnt ends, because they feel there isn't such a thing as a good burnt end on a flat. But the flat is what's turned in as far as the meat is concerned for you to judge. But when a, when a brisket is turned in, it's usually sliced. And you're judging it, you pick a slice out of the container and lay it on your judging plate. Now how do you judge it as far as tenderness is concerned? One of the easy ways to do is when you pick it up with both hands, if you can pull on it very slightly and it comes apart easily without having to tug, without it crumbling in your hand, that's probably a pretty good cooked piece of brisket. But if you have to stand there and tug on it, it snaps back at you, that's pretty tough. Now what they'll do a lot of times, and you must keep this into consideration and in your mind, the thinner the piece of pork, the thinner the brisket is sliced, usually is the more tender it is, or rather the more tough it is, I should say. Because they want you to try that brisket without thinking that it is too tough. The thicker it is, usually it's, it's well done, it's real tender, and they want it to stay together until it gets in your hands. But then again, <coughs> Pork and brisket can be overcooked. And this is something you must be determined when you're tasting it. Now, how do you determine whether it is overcooked or not? One of the easiest ways that I feel, now this is my opinion, and I've had others agree with me. I've said some, do it a different way. But I'll take a bite of brisket, or a piece of the crumbles, put it in my mouth, take my tongue, and press it up against the back of my front teeth, or the roof of my mouth. And if it dissolves, so good. There's no texture left to it. And especially for the same way. If it's properly cooked, it will do it. It'll be, it, it will come apart. It'll have texture to it, but it'll be extremely tender. Yes, I like to be able to pick it up, judge a rib. Yes, I like to be able to pick it up, and this is something I'll be honest with you. I've been doing contests and working in barbecue for almost 11 years now, but I am a certified Memphis and May judge, and I learned something from those folks about pork because they cooked pork long before we did and emphasize that but when judging ribs that when you take a rib and put it in your mouth and bite on it it should come off the bone very easily right where you bit very easy very tender you should not have to tug and then the bone should dry white almost immediately where you bit that is a properly cooked rib it comes off the bone and slides off that is open cooked it's so tender, just slides right off of it. There's nothing to hold. 
And you know, I've had my travels around the country to verify this, especially down there in the Memphis and May territory. All the cooks will say, that's right, that's the way we cook them. Anybody here disagree with that? Presentation. What we look for in taste and tenders. Taste, I can't tell you how to taste it. That's your ball game right there. But what we want you to do is be fair when you taste. There are some folks that cook out there that cook extremely sweet. There are some that cook spicy. There are some that have a tendency to cook it a little too hot, which I say is a disadvantage in a contest because spiciness can irritate your tongue and your tasting palate. So the next item comes in, you cannot really justify giving it a true taste. So most of the cooks stay away from that. However, you do find one once in a while that'll do it. But some cooks, as I said, cook sweet, some cook less sweet, some cook spicy, some cook right down the middle of the road. So what's what you're going to do when you score, like for example, when that food is taken out of the container, when the table captain says, okay, we're going to take it out of the container, we're going to place it on the judging plate, we want you to take that one second, regardless of which one you judge. You're going to have five, you're going to, in, in a regular contest, you're going to have samples out there. Today you may have two or three. I'm not sure what we have yet. Uh, but look at it. The one you want to judge first, that's your opinion. Usually we like to start at number one and go through, if that's it, uh, at the top left-hand corner, but nothing says that you can't start at the last one first. If it looks more appetizing to you and you want to do it, it may look more appetizing, you go to bite into it, you might, yeah, what's wrong with this thing, you know? So it doesn't matter where you start, but where you do start, taste that item for taste and tenderness and mark it on the scorecard, forget about it, and go to the next one. And you use the scorecard to mark it on. Not a little piece of paper tucked under your judging plate and say, well, I'm going to give this, I think this, and I'm going to give this, I think this, and this, but where do I finish? And then I'll put them on my scorecard. That's comparative. We don't do that. I've seen it done, and if I catch it, I correct it, and if the judge doesn't like it, we replace the judge. Because we do not want comparative. Yes, ma'am? Do you require palate clearing between... Yes, we have water and we have crackers and so forth for you. We do not allow smoking, and thank you for bringing that up. I'm trying to make this class a little shorter to cover the main things because of the time we have. Uh, we do not allow smoking, no alcoholic beverages whatsoever in the judging area. We prefer that you don't even have soft drinks because of the sweetness. They could change it. Muriel? Yes. I asked not, maybe not a lot of times, but there are times when we walked into the judging area and the judges are all placed. There's a judge sitting there that reaps the smell of alcohol to no end. We will ask that judge to leave. Go on down the line. And it would correspond with the squares on your judging plate. So you always want to make sure that your scorecard, regardless of which one you're using, corresponds with your judging plate. All right? One, one, two, two, three, three, one, two, three, so forth. The one thing about all the judging cards is we want you to put the judging table number down. And by the way, so on this card it says judging table it was down here at the bottom. If you do on the Scantron card, let me point out one thing about this, folks. On the Scantron card, there has to be three of these little digits filled in. So you'll always be done in number three. Now on table number one, I would write 101. Fill in 101. On table number two, I would go 202. On table number three, 303, 4404. As long as there's three digits filled in. And that's the way we'll do it right now. Start at the left-hand corner of the table, the way I'm facing, judge one, Judge two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Clockwise. That's it. That we assign you numbers and table numbers is the fact that when the table captain collects these cards, they look at them to see that they're properly done, and your number will indicate who you are if you did not fill it out properly. But let's say the table captain missed it, and Angie gets it back there to run it in the computer, and all of a sudden she says, well, "Where is this table number five? and there's no score for taste, uh, and it's judge number three. She's going to call the table captain out. Table captain's going to go back to that table, and we hope you can remember what the score was. But that's the reason we have to keep track of who you are and where you sit.
like I just saw one, uh, like the zero, for example, it was a dot on one side of the zero and a dot on the other. The line should be completely true. Okay? Card only. And this is a Scantron card. On the Scantron card only, there must always be three blocks filled in on the entire six spaces. So if you don't have a tray for number six, or you would not have a tray for number five, you would fill in zero, 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 zero. This is the only time you ever use a zero in our scoring system is if there isn't anything there. If you happen to be working with this card at a contest and only four trays come to your table, the other two blocks you don't have to worry about. These are manually read. This is computer read. And it, the computer is set up to read six scores off of this card. The first thing you're always going to do is mark the category, the next thing you're going to do is mark the table number, then the judge's number, and then as the table captain presents the tray, you will mark in the tray number until the table captain gives you the instructions to start judging. Okay? Your first entry is going to be chicken. Normally it is brisket, or rather normally it is ribs, chicken, pork, and brisket. But we then I told you how to judge a parents, what to look for, I told you how to taste it, that's your opinion, how to choose it for tenderness. And regardless of what you feel, the one that you just judged scored, it could have been all nines, does not mean that you cannot give nines to the next tray. <coughs> Give that tray, that container, for what you feel it deserves, not what you gave the previous one, because that has no bearing on it whatsoever. You know, when I get that first tray, it looks great, but I don't want to give that a nine the first time, because the next one come in might be a nine. Maybe I'll give this one an eight. That is wrong. If you think it's a nine, give it a nine. Don't worry about the next one. The next one's maybe four and fives instead of another nine. So for whatever it deserves is what I want you to get. Now, I'm going to pass out, and I'm sorry to say, and you're going to evaluate it. Usually what happens in a class like this, and always has, that the first time we judge an item, there is four to five points difference on a table amongst judges. When we finish, there's not more than two on the last item. Because you've understood from each other, and by working together, what judging is all about, and we kind of oversee it to help and guide you. Because we can't tell you what you should put there, we tell you what criteria to use to score that particular category, which I've already covered with you. The pork and brisket, we may take the whole class together because we do not put those in trays. We will let you see it in bulk. We will give you pieces of it to judge, only to cut down time. But poultry and ribs will be in a container. If you'll turn to page six in that book. Normally I have you read this with me, but I'll read it for you. And if you disagree in any part, raise your hand. Number one, this is your code of conduct that we hope you will follow throughout your judging career, judging with KCDS. And number one states, I will treat table captains, other judges, contest <coughs> officials, contestants, KCDS officials, and the general public with respect and will, by my code of conduct, bring honor to the KCBS and the Office of Certified Judge. I will not consume alcohol or other mind-altering substances prior to or during the judging. I will judge each entry on its own merit, and that's what I've tried to emphasize to you today, very important, on its own merit in keeping with KCBS standards, starting as each entry was a nine. So when that tray comes into you before it's ever opened, it's a nine. Remember that. It's up to you to determine where it goes from there. Number four, I will remain silent and maintain a neutral body language while I and others at my table are judging. Only after all judging ballots are completed and given to the table captain will I discuss the entries just judged 
if I or others choose to do so. And that's what we're going to do today, critique. Now, in a regular contest, <coughs> excuse me, when all the scorecards are pulled in by the table captain and you're waiting for the next entry, discuss the entry that you just judged all you want. It helps. It's a critique amongst yourselves at that time, and it's very beneficial. Number five, I will be true to my own taste and will not attempt to impose my personal taste or preferences on other judges. And I understand that the strict adherence to the code of conduct is necessary to maintain my certification and to qualify me for judging in case it is sanctioned contest. Do you all agree to that? If you do, I would like you to print your name where it says certified judge and ask the table captain uh, or table captains to sign their name to the right. And if you'd like any other KCBS official to sign this book, when we're through, we can do it. But the table captain will sign those books. Okay, we prefer that you do it in English. Repeat after me, I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear. To objectively and subjectively evaluate each barbecue meat. That is presented to my eyes. My nose, my nose and my palate. My palate. I, accept my duty I accept my duty to be an official KCBS certified barbecue judge so that truth, so that truth. Justice, justice, excellence in barbecue, excellence in barbecue. and the American way of life <laughs> May be, may be strengthened and preserved forever. May be strengthened and preserved forever. You are now certified. Point You judged 30 contests in five years or are constant in judging within a five-year period, you will get a master certification. The thing I would like you to mention, I would like to mention, and you must keep in mind, those Scantron cards are not bibs. They're not napkins. And not to wipe your lips with. You get barbecue sauce on those things, you get fingerprints all over, and they will not read them. So when you're judging, make sure that they are kept clear from fingers. We have napkins up there, the table captains will get them for you. Uh, keep your fingers clean before you mark on them, and the table captain will tell you what to mark on your Scantron card as you get started. Yeah, you scan Tron, you're going to zero out the bottom okay. four. Yeah. Now then on the other side, you got it on your uh, uh, How are we doing up there? Yes. Okay. 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 Entries we would send the next one cradled into here, and we would keep doing that until we had five or six entries, whatever was designated to take. Okay, now we can open up. Can you go check table three and see if the cards are available? Yes, I'll be right back. Thank you. Those that a group here, and they happen to be in the Kansas City group area, that they were told that if you ever see grill barns, you should grill down. I mean, grill down. Oh, boy. <laughs> and away we go. Grill them. Gotcha. Fry them if you have to. Now, if you see grill marks, you should judge down. Well, I don't buy that 100%, and I'll tell you why. A lot of folks will smoke chicken, and they don't feel that the skin is quite dark enough, and they will put it more in a different smoker, or one that you could say grill marks, and they'll get the heat up. And maybe on the bottom side of that piece of chicken, there might be some grill marks. But unless it looks like it's been grilled completely, I see no reason to judge down for that. And another reason is that when you judge, if you saw grill marks, that would come under appearance. You've already judged it for appearance. You can't change it. Now, another thing that was mentioned by a gentleman here, and he happens to be out of the Memphis area, it's something we do when we're judging Memphis and May style. He brought it up, and I think it's something I had not quite thought about, but I think it's a good uh, little thought to put into your mind. In Memphis in May, judging, when you judge on site, 
they'd like the judges after it's over to go back and talk to that particular team and tell them why you judged them the way you did because it helps the team to remember what they've done, either good or bad. His thought was, when you're judging here, why not just keep it in your mind that you may meet that team somehow, and you'd like to know how to explain to that team why you judged it the way you did. So it's just a little thought you can put in your mind to help you judge. So if you had to confront that team and say, I gave you a three, why did you give them a three? I gave you an eight. Why did I give you an eight instead of a nine? It's just a little thought. In Memphis and Maine, you have to go out. They ask you to go out and do this. We don't. I've seen some ones and twos and some threes and fours. And I'm wondering whether or not you all understand the scoring system. Remember, everything is a nine, folks. The only time you use a one is on disqualification. There was no trade that came out on this group that had to be disqualified thing that they shouldn't do is take ribs from three different slabs of ribs or two different slabs of ribs and put them in a container to get the good looking ones. <coughs> Remember, unless it came from the same hog, you can have a different taste no matter what you did to it. And you can only hurt yourself by mixing up the types of meat or where the meat came from that you put in the container. Now that refers to the cook only because every time a judge gets it, you know, he may, or she may judge it differently than what you think it should be, and somebody else on the table got a different rib or a different piece of chicken and judged it high. <coughs> and what we'll do a lot of times, we will print out the judges' scores, especially in a smaller contest, and let the cook see how the judges judge it. And they look at it and say, gee, those three judges gave me nines, and the other judge gave me a six, and one gave me a five. What's going on here? That judge didn't know anything. But yet you come to find out, they didn't use the same type of meat throughout the container either. A lot of times. Not always, but a lot of times. Okay? If the judge doesn't draw suspicion, I don't know. They kind of missed Yeah, I would say they're missing something there. And if you're worried about the fat content, you know, because of your diet, one little bite's not going to put on any weight. Thank <laughs> <laughs> Nothing personal, and is there anybody oh, like right. husband and wives to, we try to watch it, there's too much conversation. <laughs> In a regular contest, you would not sit together anyway. We make sure of that. No girlfriends, boyfriends, 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 girlfriends, 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 girlfriends. Yeah. Another thing I'd like to point out, if I can have your attention, please, is when you're scoring. Now, nine, again, is your highest. One is disqualification. But I'll just tell you this much now, that anything below a seven on a scorecard, that cook doesn't stand a chance. So if you don't want to, remember, we pass out score sheets by each judge at most contests. We print them out of the computer so they see how the judges work. If, if you really don't want to insult the cook and you feel that, you know, it's just so-so, don't bring the score down so darn low. That is an insult to him. Because he's going to lose anyway with a six or a five, sometimes even with a seven. And that doesn't mean you have to give everybody eights and everybody nines. I want you to be on it. But before you give it a two, I would think about giving it a five. I mean, that's one. If I gave it fives or sixes, the guy can look at it, the girl can look at it and say, maybe it was a parent's. So, gee, I better spruce up my parents, I'm getting knocked down for that. Another way they could look at it and say, well, gee, that's not so bad. I just need to do a little more work. Where if there's a two in there and they say, what is wrong with that judge? I know darn well I did that. I think they better do something about these judges, you know? These judges don't know what they're doing. So if it isn't that bad that you have to give it a two or three, in my mind, yeah, go ahead. The contest that was laid out in a tray, I would number one on the right hand, number two on the left hand. Okay, you can put your numbers down after I get through here. There have been times where certified judges have gone to a contest and said, hey, I need to judge, I'm certified. Because you're certified does not give you the privilege of going into a contest and having to have to be a judge. Because if they've already selected their judges, it's up to them. 
Now, if they want you, they'll tell you. But my suggestion to all of you are this, that if you're a member of KCBS, you will always get that newspaper stating where all the contests are. And you can always look it up, call the contest director or the number of reference in the paper for that particular contest, tell them you are a certified judge with KCBS and you'd like to judge at the contest if they have an opening. But because you're certified, don't go in there and say, hey, I'm certified, I need to judge, please. It is. You know, I told you what's allowed, what is not allowed. You have to look. You have to study. Now, in the case of the Selectro, it is a disqualification in appearance. Well, I know a couple of table captains didn't catch it. But you need to look at the trays very closely when they come in to see whether or not there's something in there that's not permitted. Like, for example, uh, cilantro was missed by at least 50% of you. That doesn't mean you have to sit there and study. But we want you to look at the trays when they come in, number one, for the type of degree that's in it, the number of pieces of meat that are in it, if, for example, there are only five pieces of meat in a container, you judge it what on appearance? All right. If that one judge does not get a piece of meat because it was only five pieces in the container, what does that one judge judge it on taste and tenderness that did not get it? Absolutely. If you do not get to judge, you give it one straight across the board. And remember, the only time you use a zero is on the Scantron card if you do not have a tray to score. Other than that, there was never anything lower than a one. A one is disqualification. Now, when you're judging pork, for example, now, one of the things that you want to take into consideration when you're judging pork is also the amount of grease that's left in it. Good smoked pork is cooked very slowly and the grease is rendered out of it. So it's nice and moist, but yet it is not greasy. Someone asked about the thickness of the brisket here. Do you slice yours that thick? And I said, no, not normally, but the thickness is based on the tenderness of the brisket, whether or not it'll stay together in the container. And that's what uh, it's all based on. However, some of this was cut thick in order just to cut it, get it out here, and give you a good thick piece of brisket to work on. As I mentioned before, You'll get your certificates and your name badge in approximately six weeks. And have a good weekend.